Okay. Okay. Can can you see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And then um, I assume. Uh, oh, I first want to say people can ask questions anytime. Feel free to interrupt anytime. Okay. Um, with with questions. So um, I'm going to be presenting on GeoRaster layer for leaflet, uh, which is the realization of truly server-free GeoTIFF visualization. And uh, we'll do some live demos too. Serverless versus server-free. Uh, this is sort of like a semantics argument. Um, a lot of times when people say serverless, uh, they mean that um, their data is stored on the server on, on S3 um, in uh, Amazon data center somewhere. Uh, and that the tile generation um, for web maps uh, happens in uh, ephemeral servers um, or what is commonly called Lambda functions. Uh, servers that um, spin up and down um, depending on the level of requests. Um, so it's very cheap, um, but we think we can make it even cheaper. Um, and the sort of halfway between serverless and server free uh, is um, when you have your data still stored on Amazon S3 or or in some uh, Microsoft data center um, and your generation of your map tiles happens uh, in the client. Uh, when I say in the client, I'm referring to the the end user's device. So if that's a mobile phone or or a laptop or really any sort of computer. Um, and then sort of the truly server free is when your data is stored anywhere, um, could be stored on your phone uh, or on a USB drive. And the map visualization, the generation of the map tiles happens on your device. Um, there's pros and cons to each side. Uh, there's not enough time to really go into all of it, um, but you just have to weigh maintenance um internet speed uh financial costs uh code complexity all of those are are things that kind of weigh into this and uh, i believe that um when things are server free uh they're easier but um that's because i like javascript and a lot of lambda functions are in python and python's great too uh okay so Leaflet.js um, is a great library and, and GeoRaster layer for Leaflet's a plug into that library. And uh, we have a mission to lower the barrier to entry, you know, to make it really easy to visualize cloud optimized GeoTIFFs or regular old GeoTIFFs on a Leaflet.js web map. Um, satellite imagery is scary and, and everyone in the community has been doing a great job making it easier for people to access that imagery. Uh, we just want to continue that work and make it even easier. Um, so if anyone uh, knows how to use Leaflet, they should know how to visualize satellite imagery. Um, so the GeoRaster layer community uh, is a community of volunteers and, and people who um, are contributing as part of their job. Uh, it includes beginners and expert developers, um, people posting issues, uh, people contributing code. Uh, I know of usage on at least six continents. Uh, not sure if anyone's using it in Antarctica yet, but uh, people do visualize data sets about Antarctica. Um, so I, I guess we'll have to go down there to, to get that to seven. Um, and uh, we have eight contributors on GitHub. Um, uh, so who uses uh, GeoRaster layer? Uh, we have a lot of cool users. Um, 
So there's small newspapers who uh, don't want to like have this big app running just to visualize some some imagery, um, but but want to have an article about climate change or something imagery related. Uh, there's uh, food security organizations in Africa that are using GeoRaster Layer to visualize um, the intersection of food security and climate. Uh, there's climate analysts. Uh, there's people looking at weather and how that intersects with airports and wants want to visualize that. Uh, we have farmers. Um, people who are, are farming crops, uh, then also people who have livestock um, and climate change scientists, uh, professors who want to teach your students, um, what are the algorithms for visualizing imagery uh, and people looking at drinking water quality, uh, people uh, startup monitoring ocean um, temperature and other factors. So the development of GeoRaster Layer is largely community-driven development. Um, and it all starts by someone sharing a, a problem or contributing a solution. So I, I wanted to... Um, structure the rest of this presentation uh, around community-driven improvements, uh, sort of known as a feature frenzy uh, for GeoRaster uh, layer, um, while also showing how how this work happens and, and how it's involving the community. So the these are the sort of um, big new improvements to GeoRaster layer since um, the, the last phosphor G in Bucharest. So uh, migration to TypeScript, um, someone in the community. And I really, I, I wanted to mention people's names, but I didn't get permission from people because, you know, obviously I've been working on this at the last minute. Um, but in the future, I'm hoping to find a way to um, really recognize people uh, for their amazing contributions and uh, if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to, to hear them uh, during the QA session. Uh, so uh, someone reached out on email uh, asking about what I thought about moving to TypeScript. Um, and we discussed it over email. I was actually sort of against it at first, but I was curious and uh, I know a lot of people have been using it and there's a lot of benefits, but it's a lot of work. Um, and, but I was won over um, by the argument that when a project's in TypeScript, it makes it a lot easier for developers to, to use it. Um, and that's just because the tooling's great. Um, there's a lot of IntelliSense and auto completion uh, and error ch checking that can happen when something's in TypeScript. Um, but it's a lot of work to, to get something into TypeScript, uh, a lot of work. Um, and so we talked about a more of a uh, GitHub issue. Uh, and then um, this community member submitted a pull request. And uh, really, it was a Herculean effort um, to, to add TypeScript to the project. Um, so there's 12 commits, 557 new lines of code. And every, every line of code was a, was a tough. Um, I think maybe the, the number of lines of code kind of might be an understatement on on how hard it was, but um, that was that was amazing. So um, so you'll see the the codes in TypeScript now. I don't know if Chris Marks is there, but I know he loves TypeScript, so hopefully he'll start using the library too. Uh, so uh, we got simple CRS. Uh, so Leaflet has um, a mode really called uh, simple or a simple coordinate reference system. And that allows you to uh, visualize a geotiff just as sort of like a plain old image. Um, you're not really comparing it to any other imagery or trying to like 
use a base map. You just want to look at the image. And so that um, conversation was public. So I'm going to just show an example real here. Here, A lot of it's like people just um, expressing a little frustration in a very polite way on Twitter about how they want a better tool for a job. And then um, people have a conversation and they end up mentioning, hey, there's this um, this tool that can visualize rasters and uh, it doesn't seem to support this use case yet, but maybe it can. And if you tag me on Twitter, I'm much more likely to see it. Uh, and so then that um, leads to a communication on GitHub uh, and then a discussion on GitHub. And uh, I was by the R spatial community. Uh, I love them. They were super helpful and just amazing people and uh, working on really cool projects um, that make this all worth it. Uh, and so they, they were helping looking at um, sea ice concentration and providing data. And uh, then I have an example of, of what that looks like. So this is an ex uh, a geotiff visualization of sea ice uh, around Antarctica. I'm not a scientist or smart enough to know what this all means, but um, but uh, yeah, people have, have used um, GeoRaster layer for leap, leaflet to visualize these sort of uh, climate change related uh, phenomena. And then the code's really simple to enable um, to enable this. You just have to add this CRS. LCRS simple uh, to your map initialization. Uh, and then when you add the GeoRaster layer, it will immediately um, just visualize it in a uh, sort of simple way. Um, we looked, at, yeah. So it helps with Antarctica, basically, and the poles where they kind of like normal maps that kind of like drops off the map or that's past the edge of the map. Um, it, the simple CRS really helps with that. Uh, are there any questions um, by the audience? I have no idea how many people are attending or if I'm just talking to myself. So um, any questions? Uh, not, not yet. Okay. Uh, but they are uh, commenting uh, in the chat. So people is uh, watching. Don't worry. You're not alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we have support for uh, almost all the standard projections. Um, and I have to say that um, I'm going to get on a little soapbox here real quickly. Uh, it really helps to be available via email. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I should do it at first, but it's turned out really well. Um, I don't think I've gotten one email that was, uh, like impolite or, or I, I wouldn't have wanted to get, I haven't been able to respond to all the requests for support. Um, but, uh, I, I do read them all and, um, sorry if I don't get to your, your issue. Uh, it's just limited time, but um, so there, there's a there's a lot of traffic that happens, uh, not on GitHub issues, but on email where where people are just they need a little help. It's not something they kind of want to publicize, um, but they they do want some help visualizing a geotiff, and it's usually an issue with the GeoRaster layer for Leaflet library um, and and not their their actual code. Um, so. So that's been great in surfacing issues. And most of the, the issues that I was emailed about um, were issues with uh, a geotiff that wasn't in um, sort of the most popular projections like 4326 or Web Mercator or UTM, but was on in another sort of projection. And with GDAL, you can convert that to um, a Web Mercator or the 4326 projection, but 
uh, that's sometimes people don't know anything about GDAL or really are new to GIS and new to, to coding. And so we want to keep things as easy as possible. Um, and so in order to make things as easy as possible for our users and uh, to alleviate basically half of all the support requests, uh, we added in uh, projection support. Um, and that's done by using this uh, Proj4 fully loaded library, uh, which is um, basically the wonderful Proj4.js library, but with um, most of the standard projections uh, preloaded. Uh, and you might be asking, um, wouldn't that blow up my bundle size? Wouldn't that just take up tons of megabytes and, and really slow down the application? And uh, the answer is no. And uh, I hope you attend uh, my talk in a few hours on the JSON to code compression, uh, where I'll go into how we were able to compress uh, this information to a, to a man manageable um, level. So uh, I'm going to show an example here. Uh, so this is a Landsat image uh, with some band arithmetic, arithmetic applied, and it's uh, visualizing uh, a wildfire uh, in California, uh, where it's just sort of highlighting the red pixels here. And you can see in the, the top the, um, the smoke from the fire. Uh, and code-wise, um, there's not much you have to change there. Uh, here's the here's the code. Uh, it just on you don't have to put in projection information. It just it reads the the rasters uh, and uh, pulls out projection information. Um, and uh, it would be a good time now for me to mention uh, the. GeoTiffJS library, uh, which makes this all possible. And uh, that's the library that's doing the low level um, GeoTiff decoding uh, in reading of the metadata and like projection information and that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Uh, so, um, that is most of our, our updates. Um, let me see if I, hopefully I didn't miss one. Oh, yes. We have, we have a, a, a new update um, that we don't have a, a public example yet. Um, like that's kind of easy through your, your web browser, but we, we have some, uh, some tasks that I wanted to show. Um, let's do this. Okay, let's. So the way, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is sort of hidden behind um, the a debugging feature in the library, um, but it but it's all um, so we're going to uh, reload this. So what you're seeing in the bounty boxes are the tile calculations for the library, and um, we implemented a new algorithm. Uh, we're sort of calling it like inner tiling. But you could think of it as subtiling or or some other word like that. And uh, basically, uh, what it's doing is kind of breaking down our assumptions about the size of tiles. Uh, typically, tiles are two fifty six by two fifty six or five twelve by five twelve, uh, and it's standard, and that makes things easy. Um, we kind of take that the tile container, which is in the blue and then dynamically calculate 
the part of the data that actually intersects that tile. So in the this top left container, um, we're at sort of the, that's the XYZ, the label. Um, uh, so uh, that the, the dotted line in red is that inner tile. Um, and so what it's doing is it's actually resizing the tile. So it's only um, a few pixels wide uh, because you really don't need to visualize all of that. So I'm gonna show you that um, in the, the HTML here. Uh, so we have our canvas elements. And so here you'll see that um, the padding left 224 pixels. So that's basically empty space on the left. And so this new subtiling is there to improve performance. So you're not trying to color or visualize a whole tile there. Um, you're just visualizing the, the part that you need. Um, and so that that's sort of it for the, the presentations. Um, okay, good question. that's great. Daniel, you have a lot of questions, so we can go to them. Um, you can look at them. I post one in the ch of our chat, in the private chat. Oh. Um, is what is the tech behind approach for full loaded? Oh, uh, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I love the question. Um, it's really nothing fancy. Um, it uh, basically, uh, there's a, another uh, library. Um, I, a short answer is scrape epsg.io's Docker container and create a CSV of all this projection information, uh, compress it, and then um, load that information when we. Uh, and in, in put it in the project for definitions. I'm going to, yeah, I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen. Am yeah, I? yeah, I oh. can, uh, once okay. you put the the thing you want to show, I, I can add it to the stream. Now you're in Google. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm gonna give any, it's, this code is so small and simple. Um, I'm going to, uh, just share it here. It's Perfect. like maybe less than ten lines of code, um, but it's just it's just yeah okay. But yeah, feel free to follow up um, if you have any more questions about it. Okay, great. Um, another question is: Any plans to add NetCDF support to GeoRaster? That one, um, I want to hear that what the community thinks and the pros and cons. I would love it. Uh, NetCDF uh, is not a thing that I'm. An expert in uh, my impression with NetCDF, and feel free to like take to Twitter and tell me I'm wrong, um, is that it's not like a strictly evenly distributed grid format. It's more sample points that can be arbitrarily spaced, uh, which makes the algorithms and the usage of it a lot more complicated. I know you can sort of gridify or um, uh, create grids from uh, NetCDF, but my impression is that um, it would it would increase the scope of things, uh, make things more complicated. Uh, it still might be worth it uh, just to make things easier. And I know a lot of uh, climate data is in NetCDF, and um, it's a great format. I I just that that that's sort of my sort of the open question would be like. How do we do it in a way that keeps the complexity under wraps? Great. Uh, there is another question I, po I posted to you in the chat. Is there any way to load a COG from a URL that requires authentication? Yes, um, that, that's something, uh, unfortunately, you'd have to implement. Um, so there's two ways you could do that. Uh, the first is that the library will support just loading directly in an array buffer or a file. So if it's like uh, less than a megabyte or your users are on really fast internet connections um, and maybe it's like five, 10 megabytes, 
um, you can do that, uh, you know, sign a URL or authenticate and then just return that whole GeoTIFF to the browser and it can directly load that array buffer so you don't have to do any visual uh, authentication there. Um, if you do want to uh, authenticate and you're using like S3 and I know like Ali, is that called Alibaba and Microsoft all copying us, uh, S3 now. Um, and so you can like sign URLs uh, to static assets. So you could um, then just create a signed URL and then you don't have to really set up the authentication for each re request. It will then make the request for the parts of the data that it needs from that file. Um, or if you wanted to set up like a cores proxy uh, you or um, sorry, authentication proxy, you, you'd have to set up some sort of proxy server that, that um, sits in the middle. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question is, looks like in many ways, COG raster projects are building on the same GTF. Any upstream limitation from that? And I want to I hear what the upstream limitations are. Um, <laughs> there, there's um, some uh, bundling uh, issues um, that, that happen uh, sometimes, just because like there's a lot of different people with a lot of different use cases, and um, I'm... Uh, uh, I, I, for the most part, I'm trying to use the GeoTIFF JS library from raw source code and not, um, I prefer to do that versus prefer to use the bundle. Um, so that, um, when we're running the build of this GeoRaster layer library, it can, um, optimize the, the bundle and not duplicate dependencies, um, but any sort of upstream limitations. I have. I don't think there's any limitations other than what we can contribute to the library. If there's anything missing there, I, the Fabian, EOX, all the contributors are amazing there and really are, are great. And so I, I think if there isn't anything there, um, I found the community very welcoming there and I think you'd be able to, to contribute. Okay, uh, one more question. Have you seen any usage of GeoRaster in Zizium or other 3D mapping li lips? Uh, not yet. Um, I believe CCM has their own sort of way to do things. Um, uh, with regards to 3D mapping libraries, my impression is most of the 3D mapping libraries, if not all, uh, use GPUs. Uh, if you know an exception to that, uh, please post that in the chat for everyone to see. Uh, and a GeoRaster layer is really going back to that mission. The core mission is supporting um, like everyone and not everyone has access to GPU. Um, and so that kind of limits what we can do. Uh, I think sort of sort of 2.5D um, uh, altitude um, land elevation, uh, uh, digital, digital elevation model, that sort of stuff. Hill shading, that's the word, hill shading. <laughs> uh, you, 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 that's like um, on the roadmap for GeoRaster layer. One should be able to add that to the library. Um, or if you could write a custom function for that, but um, it's, uh, it's I, I'd love to say yes, but there's just more optimization that, that needs to happen before we can really do that sort of level of visualization. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. There are some questions, but more, but I, we don't have much time, so maybe you can continue in the chat. Uh, in the chat of the Benulis. I just leave you the, the questions there. Thank and you. then, okay, see you and thank you very much for your presentation.